So it's really um, exciting to have Dr. Kerr here. She is the Lewis Nurberg Research Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, she's also the, she's many hats. She's the director of the Ann Arbor VA Center for Clinical Management Research. She's a VA Health, which is a VA Health Services Research Development Center of Innovation. She's the director of the Michigan Program on Value Enhancement and a member of the University of Michigan Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation. Dr. Kerr is coming back home today. She received her MD from UCSF and completed her internship and residency right here at UCLA. She subsequently completed the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program here at UCLA, and she also received a Master's of Public Health from our School of Public Health here at UCLA. She spent two years on the faculty, and uh, despite everybody's best efforts, she got uh, recruited away to the University of Michigan. And she continued to develop methods um, to assess and improve quality, appropriateness, and patient-centered care. Dr. Kerr has done truly groundbreaking work in developing clinically meaningful and valid ways to assess and motivate quality improvement for patients at high risk for poor outcomes, while at the same time minimizing potential for unintended consequences. Dr. Kerr has spoken nationally and internationally on performance measurement, and she's published over 100 books book chapters, manuscripts, and editorials in high-impact journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine, including um, an article that came out yesterday in the New England Journal, um, uh, JAMA, JAMA Internal Medicine, Harvard Business Review, and many others. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the Association of American Physicians, the American Society of Clinical Investigation, and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. So we're very fortunate to have her today. Thank you for being here, Dr. Kerr. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it is truly uh, a pleasure to uh, come back to UCLA to present uh, to you today um, and to be part of this really exciting kickoff in your efforts in, uh, in value-based uh, research. Um, and let's see here. I'll use this instead. Um, so, as uh, Catherine said, um, UCLA is very near and dear to my heart. In fact, I spent uh, many happy times and very uh, long nights um, at this hospital, not the hospital that was on the first slide. Um, and my um, older daughter was, in fact, born in this hospital uh, just a few months after the Northridge earthquake. Um, so it was also at UCLA that I first became interested in doing uh, research on quality of care um, and what I guess we're now calling value-based care. Um, and it was really under the mentorship of Bob Brooks. So many of us are uh, invoking Bob today. I know he can't be here. Um, but um, it was under the mentorship of Bob that I started um, really focusing on quality of care research. And um, I think Bob probably needs no introduction to most of you in this room, but uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I think of him, I think many of us think of him as the father of appropriateness. He's, of course, a professor still here at UCLA, but is also the former director at Rand Health and the developer of the Rand UCLA appropriateness method, which I was going to describe, but I now don't have to because Catherine did such a great job. So um, my talk will be shorter. Um, so. Um, the, uh, you know, in developing the RAND appropriateness method, um, Bob said an appropriate procedure is one in which the expected health benefit, and, and even back then, Bob was thinking about health benefit in a lot of different ways. It wasn't just about longevity. It was also about quality of life. It was also about functional status. But that expected health benefit exceeds the expected negative consequences by a sufficiently wide margin that the procedure is worth doing. Um, and, and at this time, you know, Bob was really thinking about quality of care. Um, and, and he wrote also in this paper that it, this was motivated uh, by the desire to make sure that patients get the care they need, the care that's indicated, but not care that they don't need or that may be harmful to them. Um, and, you know, we, we also heard this morning that value has a lot of definitions, that cost is often included in value. But that, that there's a thread, that there, there's a common theme in value. And I think the common theme is around benefit, um, that something is worth doing. And whether, whatever perspective you have, uh, that uh, form of benefit is really, really important to the um, argument of value. And it's really from 
that perspective that I want to um, speak to you about today, about value in healthcare. Um, and why I think it's important to improve healthcare value, what we need to do to solve the overuse puzzle, how we're going to move forward, um, incorporating <coughs> innovation and collaboration, something you all have already started to talk about, and why I think that ultimately it will take a system to, um, to move the needle on value. So as I said, it was when I was at UCLA and then also ran that I be, um, began to work on quality of care research and I began to work with uh, Beth McGlynn, who's here in the audience, uh, Steve Ash and the RAND team. Um, and we began to develop a comprehensive examination of um, quality of care delivered to adults in the United States. Um, and what we, what we wanted to look at was um, uh, how, um, how how good quality care is. Uh, we found, unfortunately, it, it's not that great. Um, we developed 439 indicators of quality, as you heard today, that um, is a difficult job. It took us really quite a long time. We applied it to 7,000 adults uh, leave, living in uh, 12 metropolitan communities in the United States. And we found that any way you look at it, um, adults in the United States received about half of recommended care and that strategies to reduce these deficits uh, were warranted. So we published this in 2003, um, and um, you know, I guess one of your questions would be, well, what's happened since then? Um, yeah, Beth wants to know too, because um, despite our best efforts, we haven't been able to get another study of this caliber funded to examine whether quality of care has changed over that period of time. Um, and so, um, so we, don't, we know that our study has been cited a lot of times. Um, we know that in many ways it has motivated uh, more approaches to measuring quality and, and, and more quality improvement. Um, and here's um, just a snapshot of a paper that was published very recently by a Harvard group. They used quite a different methodology to look at quality of care, many fewer measures. Uh, but even with this snapshot of quality, what they found was that since 2002 to um, just a few years ago, uh, quality of care um, measurement, it, it hasn't budged. It, you know, again, this is just for a few things that recommended testing, diabetes care, uh, but they found really no improvement in quality. Um, and uh, more pertinent perhaps to this discussion, they also looked at some um, some measures of avoiding inappropriate care. And again, they found um, high uses of inappropriate care and no change uh, between 2002 and 2012, or very, very little change. So as Catherine already told you, um, in uh, 2009, um, the Institute of Medicine looked at this. They said of the 2.5 trillion spent in US on healthcare at that time, uh, 765 billion, or approximately 30% is waste, of which unnecessary services accounted for about $210 billion. Um, Don Berwick, who also was mentioned today, previously the head of CMS, IHI, um, also called for eliminating waste in U.S. healthcare, and he pointed out that one of the largest categories um, of waste is overtreatment and overtesting. Um, also an estimate of about 200 billion. More empirically, um, Aaron Schwartz um, and the uh, uh, Harvard group <coughs> measured 26 services that were considered unnecessary, um, and he, he used uh, Medicare data, administrative data to do this. He found that overuse affected more than 25% of <laughs> Medicare beneficiaries, and it um, accounted for about 2 billion to 9 billion, depending on how you looked at it. Uh, Medicare expenditures in one year. That's just for those 26 measures. Um, Carrie Cola also looked at variation in um, overuse of services. She looked at 11 uh, measures of inappropriate care with Medicare data um, and found a wide range of uh, variation in overuse. Um, and um, it also varied by the measure. So some measures had very low rates of overuse and some measures like getting EKGs before lower surgery, which Catherine talked about today, um, nearly 50% overuse. 
But variation isn't limited to Medicare. Um, this is a study that we did in the VA. Uh, we looked at overuse of screening colonoscopy. My colleague, um, Samir Saini, um, was the lead on this. And we found nearly a five-fold uh, variation in overuse of screening colonoscopy across facilities in the VA. But that's not to say that the system doesn't make a difference. Um, we also looked at comparing overuse in certain select services between the VA and Medicare. Uh, this is for um, neuroimaging for non-traumatic headache. And you can see that the VA had an overuse rate of about 22 percent, uh, while Medicare was um, closer to 50 percent. Um, and that um, difference persisted, even though it got smaller. Uh, when we were very specific with the type of headache um, that, was, um, that we looked at. Um, and, and the system can make a difference, and that persists even when overuse rates are very low. Um, so one of the things that we also looked, you know, wanted to look at is, um, you know, are all um, things that are not indicated, are they being performed? Because we're talking about here like everything that isn't indicated is being performed at a high rate. Um, here we looked at stress testing before lower surgery. Uh, we found that the VA had an overuse rate of less than 1%, um, and Medicare came in at about 2%, so higher than the VA, but still really, really low, maybe within um, uh, even measurement error low, so. Overuse isn't limited to procedures and tests. Um, overuse is also important for um, treatment. Um, this is uh, treatment um, we looked at treatment de-intensification, which would be appropriate uh, for patients with diabetes, older patients with very low A1Cs, that's a measure of glycemic control. So patients with very low A1Cs are at risk for hypoglycemia, uh, falls, and other adverse outcomes. So de-intensification of treatment is a good thing. Um, here you could see uh, two things. One is that universally rates of de-intensification for these patients are low. Uh, nobody came in and higher than about a quarter of these patients, but the VA was doing a slightly better job than, uh, than Medicare and commercially insured. Again, the system can make a difference. And um, the public is beginning to take notice of this. Um, this, this is uh, just one of several um, 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 articles that the New York Times has run on this, um, on the point of uh, over-treatment and over-testing. Wall Street Journal has had similar articles. Um, so the public and the press are beginning to notice, um, and I think that that's an important consideration uh, when, we, when we think about um, reducing low-value care in health systems as well. So what we know right now is that there's a lot of overuse, and um, we need to figure out how to um, change that. So I want to tell you about one of my patients. I, I um, am a primary care doctor at the VA in Ann Arbor. Um, and one of the things that you may not have as much of here um, in Los Angeles that we have a lot of in Michigan are snowbirds. Do you guys know what snowbirds are? Yeah. So <laughs> we have a lot of snowbirds. They, they leave around November and they come back in April. And, um, and often they go to Florida. So, so one of my patients, such a, such a man, he's a 77-year-old man with diabetes and right knee pain from osteoarthritis. Uh, we, he had physical therapy back in Ann Arbor. He actually was doing pretty well uh, with his knee osteoarthritis, but he went to Florida for the winter, and I think he walked more or, you know, whatever. His pain got worse. Um, so a lot of the snowbirds, they might go to a local VA, but sometimes they'll just, you know, use their Medicare and they'll go to whatever doctor they can get to there. Um, so they, he went to a local orthopedist, and um, that orthopedist did an MRI, and he told him he needed an arthroscopy. Well, he said, well, I don't want to pay for that. I'll come back to the VA to get that. So he comes back to see me, and he says, hey, I need a consult to orthopedics, right? And so um, now it's my job to tell him that, in fact, he may not need that at all, and maybe we could do physical therapy again, or maybe it'll just get better on its own. Um, and I think to the physicians in this room, this is a pretty common scenario, right? We think that, um, especially that maybe the primary care physicians, we think that um, our patients often want more medical care, um, and we think that a lot of that is also driven by specialists, right? Um, 
it's never us. We're not the ones prescribing. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, th this is um, this is a common problem, and um, we've been grappling, and so many of you in this room have been grappling with, you know, so why does this happen? Um, and John Ianian and, and I, um, John is the director of our um, Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, did some thinking about this a few years ago. Um, and we divided up kind of the um, why it's hard to stop um, overuse into um, uh, two different categories. And the first we kind of divided up into f physician and system factors. Um, and a lot of these have already been mentioned today. So it's really hard to always know the right thing to do. Someone said, you know, there's so many studies coming out all the time, and I have this patient in front of me, I don't know which one to apply. It's just, it's really hard. Um, and as doctors, we often overvalue our own services. So that orthopedist maybe knew the literature um, that there have been, um, that there have been randomized controlled trials of sham arthroscopy that actually said that there was no benefit, but for, but in his hands, for that patient in front of him, he still thought there was benefit, right? Um, it's also really hard to stop doing something once it's routine. So for my patients who are who with an A1C, even as they get older, even as they develop chronic renal disease, and their A1C keeps on going down, but they're kind of doing okay. Like, why should I rock the boat? It's just really hard to stop doing things. Um, of course, and we've talked about this, system factors and incentives can drive us to do more, and, and that has to be front and center. And there's liability concerns. What if I miss something? There's also, of course, patient factors. We think, we think Americans think, that more care is better and that less is rationing. So for some health systems, um, it, you know, we worry that if we tell a patient, no, you can't have something, they're, they're going to think we're just trying to save money. Um, and for patients, too, beliefs about health care are hard to change. We've certainly witnessed this um, with um, prescription of antibiotics for URIs and, and viral illnesses. You know, how many years of campaigns by the CDC has it been? Um, and we are still having a hard time changing uh, people's perspectives on that. So these were theories, and we wanted to test some of these theories, and we actually started doing some surveys. Um, and this is a survey we did a couple of years ago in both the U.S. and, and the VA. Um, and these were um, nationally, represent, nationally representative sample of primary care providers in the U.S. and in the VA. And we asked them um, to rate their concerns as a major barrier to reducing overuse and, um, and which ones they agreed with. And as you can see here, um, for, especially for those practicing in the U.S., the current medical malpractice system was a major barrier to reducing overuse. But almost as high was patient requests for tests and treatment. So again, this thinking that patients want more care, uh, the number of tests and treatments recommended by specialists, and then this is really important, lack of time for shared decision making with patients. And somebody already talked about that today, lack of time. Um, the other thing I just want to point out was how remarkably similar the rates are between the U.S. and the VA. They, they, these were the same questions, but administered separately. And I just found that really remarkable, except for the medical malpractice. There were some reasons that were less frequently cited. Um, lack of time to assess individual patient benefits, still at least one third. Um, performance measures that reward ordering more services. We are, had some discussion about performance measurement. Payment policies, a third, um, we're concerned about that but less often cited lack of automated clinical decision support, only about um, you know, 15 to 20%. So that's what physicians think, but what do patients think? And if you, st there are other surveys of physicians and the results aren't all that different from ours, but there are very few surveys of patients. In fact, there are hardly any. Um, we were fortunate, um, just very recently, this just came out um, a month or two ago, um, we have a national poll on healthy aging at the University of Michigan IHPI, partly funded by AARP, um, and we were able to get in a few questions about um, older Americans' views of overuse of healthcare services, um, and we looked at their agreement with um, certain statements. This is a nationally representative um, survey, uh, internet survey of patients using the Knowledge Network, for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, so the first question we ask them is how much do they agree that more, more medical treatment is usually better? A and I think this is pretty remarkable because our hypothesis was it was going to be like 60%, maybe 70, 14% 
felt that more medical treatment is usually better. Um, the other thing that, that I was a little bit surprised by is that they also said that providers often order services patients don't need. 55% agreed that providers often order services patients don't need, but they didn't think their provider offered it nearly, nearly as much, only 25%. So there's kind of a little bit of a theme there. Um, so um, I, I think patients and physicians <laughs> Agree. They often agree that there's overuse, but they might not agree on the reasons, on the root causes of that overuse. And, you know, so one of the ch our challenges is, I think, how do we get patients and physicians on the same page here? And, and this is, I think, where the Choosing Wisely <coughs> campaign um, is, is really so important. Um, most of you probably know about the Choosing Wisely campaign launched in 2012 by the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation. Um, it, uh, each society, they uh, work with medical societies, develops five things physicians and patients should question. Um, and they um, are promoting patients to help them choose care that's supported by the evidence, not duplicative, free from harm, and truly necessary. Um, so the Choosing Wisely campaign has been around for a little over five years now. I think it's stimulated um, an incredible amount of discussion and study. Um, I think what's remarkable over that five years um, that we went from something like, um, I, think, I think it was like 40 to 50 recommendations to now over 500 recommendations about things that patients and providers should question. Um, almost 100 societies have joined the effort. And the uh, blue line there is articles, and they were really quality improvement articles. So articles, uh, articles in interventions, not just quality improvement, interventions to decrease low value care. Um, and that's still going up. So it, it really has sparked a lot of study as evidenced by people um, already speaking in this room. So um, I think the natural question then is, um, do those studies work? And um, you know, are we going in the right direction with choosing wisely? Um, and this is, I think, a really useful framework that Carrie Cola from Dartmouth developed um, to try to categorize or characterize interventions around low value care. And she looked at that, for, she looked at it from the demand side or the consumer side um, and the supply side, um, so the provider and the system. Looking at um, the demand side, she categorized it into incentives like patient cost sharing, value-based insurance design, and information like patient education and provider report cards. And from the supply side, also looking at incentives um, like pay for performance and information like clinical decision support. And then um, she actually looked at all the articles that were published through 2015 that were interventions and started to look at, this was, um, a, uh, a meta-analysis of effectiveness of published interventions to reduce low value care. And without going through this whole thing, I just want to call your attention to a couple things. The first is that at the very top, um, the patient cost sharing, patient education provider report cards, those are the patient um, um, interventions, right? So uh, the demand side. There aren't that many of them. That's the main, that's the main thing there. Down here, we have clinical decision support, clinical education provider feedback. This is where all the action is, right? Um, and the green line is effective. So some of them are effective, but certainly not all of them. Uh, now, I want to call your attention to the fact that the, the providers said only 20% of them wanted more clinical decision support, right? They wanted more time <laughs> with the patient. No, nobody tested more time. So that, that isn't kind of one of the frameworks here, okay? Now, um, the next thing they actually looked at is the quality of the published interventions to reduce low value care. And this is a little bit more troubling. And again, the only thing I want you to pay attention to here is the red and the blue, okay? Um, because the, the, the red and the blue, these are the low quality studies, okay? And if you look at this slide, there's a lot of red and blue. Okay, and, and that's the main thing to take away from, from this slide is that we're doing a lot of studies and that's good, but we're not doing a lot of high quality studies. And if we're doing those studies, we're spending resources, we're spending time, but we may not be getting the results that are really valuable that we can use within our health systems to move forward. 
So we were also interested in what measures are being used to assess effectiveness of these interventions. Um, and that was something that Carrie hadn't done. So we actually updated her um, literature review through 2016, uh, now found 101 articles, but we looked at the measures that were being used to assess effectiveness. Um, and in this case, we found that uh, most of the published studies um, use some assessment of utilization and ordering. So you do an intervention to um, look at whether people are ordering less antibiotics, and you just look at the number of antibiotics ordered. Uh, about half of the studies did look at appropriateness, so whether those antibiotics were now being used in, for the appropriate patients. Um, but only a third looked at unintended consequences. And this is really important because um, when you start decreasing using something, um, testing or, or treatment, you really need to make sure you're doing it for the right patient and, and, that, you, those, and that the patients um, aren't being harmed, right? And, and so, because if you're targeting it in the wrong way, um, you may have patients not coming back to the emergency room or getting sicker if you're not tracking that. Or you may have substitution of other tests. You know, maybe you're not doing any more CTs, but now you're doing a lot of x-rays. Um, and very few studies are tracking that. And the last point, and I think that this is just really, really important, is that only less than 10% of the studies assess any patient experiences or patient-reported outcomes. We're just not doing that. We're looking at administrative data most of the time. We're not asking the patients what they think. So um, John earlier asked, you know, where do we need to go in some of our research? And I just want to call out a few gaps. Um, of course, there are studies that have done this really well, and I'll mention those in a minute. Uh, but the gaps for, that I see in current interventions are um, that they focus almost exclusively on supply side fa factors on the provider and the system. They rarely use high quality study designs. They rarely track patient reported experiences and outcomes. They rarely assess unintended consequences. And they tend to be incremental rather than transformational. And, and I'll come back to that point. So what do we need to do to move us forward? Um, and um, I think focusing really on innovation and collaboration as this, as this uh, new effort here at UCLA is doing. Uh, we wrote a paper um, a year ago or so on um, how to fulfill the promise of choosing wisely in the next five years. As I mentioned, I think choosing wisely has laid an incredible foundation for all of us to move forward, uh, but, but we need to continue to move it forward. So, so um, what are some of the things we can do? And, and I'm just going to talk today about um, moving forward by using innovative strategies to reduce low-value care, meaningful measures and evaluation techniques, and collaborative implementation and dissemination. So I'll take each of these in turn. Um, so as we think about developing our innovative strategies, um, we, one of the things we've seen is that the interventions often don't target root causes of low value services. That we don't stand back and actually do an evaluation of why is the low value care happening, why are certain things being ordered, and what approach might be used to then decrease that low value care. Often, what we have some knee-jerk reactions. It's like, oh, well, we're ordering too many things, so we need another best practice alert in Epic um, to do that when we don't necessarily understand uh, that it may be something totally different. And I heard a, a great example at Kaiser yesterday, if you don't mind I share that anecdote, um, that one of the Kaiser researchers um, was looking at why providers are ordering um, uh, certain tests for patients with um, stable um, after treatment for breast cancer and um, you know when they were clearly not indicated and what what they what they found was that the providers were actually saying it's like well you know the it when I order those tests I know I don't need them but it decreases the patient's anxiety when they see that it's normal or it decreases my anxiety because I know it's normal um, now, that's not an excuse for ordering the test that isn't indicated, obviously, and there's a lot of negative consequences of doing so. Uh, but understanding that that was, is one of the drivers may completely change the intervention we do. And that, that's really important. 
Um, the other point is to leverage existing behavioral science frameworks when, when we then start to design those interventions, and Daniela talked about that today, so I, I won't go into it at length. Um, and then the last point is to pursue cultural change among clinicians and patients. Um, and so it, it's going to take more than just um, restricting ordering um, because we, uh, we at first we can't do it one test at a time, and then if we take away those alerts or, or incentives, if the ordering just goes back to where it was, that's not going to be helpful. It's going to take some more fundamental cultural change. Um, and I just want to call your attention to, again, I think this very helpful, helpful framework uh, from Michael Parchman and um, the group at the McCall Institute. Um, at, at Kaiser to, on taking action at overuse and creating that kind of culture for change. Um, and what needs to be done in order to do that. And, and the first thing that they actually really talk, oops, talk about is, yeah, is to commit resources to measurement. And so that has come up over and over again here already this morning. Uh, we don't know what to target. We don't know where we need to go if we don't have good measures uh, for, for that assessment. So the next is um, meaningful measures and evaluation techniques. Again, uh, we saw that a lot of the studies that have been done are not of high quality. Uh, but we know how to do rigorous and often practical study designs within health systems. They don't always have to be uh, patient uh, randomized controlled trials. Um, and so, so we can do that. Um, measure clinically meaningful outcomes and unintended consequences is really important. Uh, relying entirely on the administrative data might not get us there, probably won't. Um, and then also while we're doing these studies to assess barriers and facilitators of success. So using implementation science methods that are now well established uh, to understand what's working and what's not working even as we're intervening both so we can correct course, but also so that we can um, um, better disseminate to other health systems if we understand what the barriers and facilitators are. So I just want to um, shout out uh, to a couple of studies that I have found uh, particularly valuable um, and, and learning from in my career. And, and this, is, this is one by Daniela Meeker, who um, was talking today. Um, and I think this, I, I actually think, and I told her this this morning, that I think this is like the best example of an incredibly rigorously large, um, rigorously done large study uh, to reduce low value care. Um, and she said, well, there was more we could have done. I'm like, I'm sure there was. <laughs> <laughs> and she will, I'm sure, in her next study. So, um, but again, without going into the details, uh, there's just a few things I want to call out on this. They, they, used, oops, they used three different um, interventions, um, in this case, accountable justification, peer comparison, and suggested alternatives to reduce uh, inappropriate antibiotic prescribing uh, for URIs. Um, and there's just a couple of things I want you to know. So first of all, um, they had this great control. Uh, but rates of prescribing in the control were going down, right? And so if all they had done was, if they didn't have a control and all had, they had done was kind of a before and after, they would say that all three approaches worked uh, because they wouldn't have had a control. And you can see that actually there is some, you know, probable decrease. Uh, but with the control, you can actually see that only two of the interventions um, uh, were, were at least statistically um, effective. Um, so, so that, that, that is, um, you know, I think just a, an important thing to remember when you're doing your designs that, and, and they don't always, ha it doesn't always have to be a randomized controlled trial, but to have some kind of control and some kind of control, concurrent control um, is often very useful. Uh, but you don't always have that luxury, and I know working in health systems, I'm not always given that luxury. Um, so this is, again, an, another um, example by um, Catherine Kahn and her group of a large, um, more observational study looking at pre-post, um, but using a um, um, very careful design to look at appropriateness of ratings uh, by the period. And um, one of the things that they found here was that um, you have to look 
under the surface because um, a lot of the, um, this, this was an intervention of clinical decision support to decrease inappropriate use of advanced imaging. And when this um, clinical decision support was supposed to trigger for a lot of the tests, but it didn't actually trigger uh, for about two thirds of the tests. And then when it did trigger, um, it oh, was only minimally effective um, to reduce inappropriate care. And they did a very uh, careful analysis looking at both appropriate equivocal and inappropriate care. So they were able, again, not to just look at utilization. Um, and also did a mixed methods evaluation to try to understand what worked and what didn't work. And then this is just another example from my um, colleague Jeff Culgren, who also studies behavioral economics approaches. And what I want to call out here was his use of a uh, um, step wedge cluster randomized trial. Um, and what's nice about that approach is that um, you know, especially when you're working in health systems, um, a lot of clinics say, well, but, my, but you know, every clinic has to get this intervention. And, um, and, and you could say, yeah, okay, that's fine. They just won't get it all at the same time. And so you can um, use staged approaches um, and, and very rigorous approaches to look at um, what works for decreasing low value care. And he also, in this particular study, I'm not showing this, but also looked at unintended consequences um, and looked at and found that there were large substitution effects. So even though there was a decrease in ordering of um, CTs for low back pain, there were more specialty referrals um, and there were more x-rays being ordered. So um, looking at that is really important because it may impact your health systems uh, in ways that you don't anticipate. So finally, um, I want to talk about collaborative implementation and dissemination. Um, and one of the things that, um, in order to move us forward, um, we really, I feel strongly that um, we need to do more of what UCLA is doing here, which is to bring together academic partners with health systems, payers, patients, and communities to test and disseminate these successful approaches. So it's really in that spirit of collaboration that we launched about a year and a half ago the Michigan Program on Value Enhancement. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that program and, and um, hopefully and, and can take more questions um, in, the, in the question period. So um, the University of Michigan has a large institute for healthcare policy and innovation. It crosses um, 17 schools and colleges of the University of Michigan. Uh, we have over 500 members who do health services and health policy research. Uh, about 100 or so of those members are really interested in quality and, and value in health care. Um, and we thought it was time to bring together the expertise oh. of our IHPI members with the needs of our health system at Michigan Medicine um, to launch a program to improve care value at Michigan Medicine, support research, and influence policy. Our mission is to um, prove and improve the value of care at Michigan Medicine by bringing together leaders in research, design, management, and clinical care to support transformative <laughs> approaches in evaluation and implementation through the lens of appropriateness. Um, and this is a program that, that we launched, um, like I said, about a year and a half ago. It is funded internally by the, primarily by the health system. It sits in the quality department. Uh, it has some funding from the institute as well, but it's a minority of the funding. It is not an operational unit. We work more uh, as a kind of consultancy, if you will. Um, we partner with operational units um, and clinicians um, to help um, increase the rigor of the evaluations that they're doing, help them with design approaches. Um, if they really, you know, they know they want to reduce low value care, for example, in a particular area, um, how would they go about doing that? Um, we have um, experts in implementation science, in uh, methodology and analysis, in clinical care within our group, but it's a pretty small unit at this point. Um, we also try to encourage learners to join our group um, from students, uh, you know, across the schools uh, to fellows. Um, you know, we have, uh, we've had uh, students from like art and design and thinking about patient-centered design from engineering, from business um, working with us. So it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of bring in the strength of the university to some of the problems of the health system. Uh, I'm not going to go through um, all the projects that we're doing right now. Um, 
except to say uh, a couple of things. One is that we've been focusing a lot on test on um, laboratory testing and imaging, um, and both how to measure um, unnecessary care in those areas and then how to reduce it. Um, and the other thing we did in this last year is a research innovation challenge uh, where we brought together um, about 60 researchers as well as some clinical leaders um, and had a full day discussion in groups um, about specific um, challenges in research um, that they were interested in. Um, and then we had a competition um, to, uh, bring, to bring teams together um, for some pilot funding to develop large-scale research grants, um, that, and that's ongoing right now. So that, that was uh, exciting for us. Um, we feel that we've already started to add value to Michigan Medicine uh, through more informative interventions and eva evaluations, new measures and measurement approaches, engagement of learners and faculty, promotion of research and grant funding, and uh, beginning local and national visibility. And of course, our goal is really to uh, try to put Michigan Medicine on the map as being a leader in, uh, prom in promoting uh, both research but also uh, clinically active interventions on uh, reducing low value care and becoming a leader in delivery of high value care. So um, we think we've made progress, but we know we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, because ultimately, I think to really uh, change the equation on value, it's going to take a system, and that's just, it's going to take go beyond a single institution. Um, so, in preparing this talk, I started to think a little bit about you know what is a system, and I gravitated to this um, definition by the World Health Organization, um, and they said that a, a well-functioning system, health system improves the health status of individuals, families, and communities, defends the population against health threats, protects people against the financial consequences of ill health, and provides equitable access to people-centered care. Um, and I think that um, as much as I'd like to believe that the VA does some of this, and I'm sure all of you um, think that UCLA, and I'd like to think that University of Michigan does some of this, I think we probably would agree that our systems right now don't do all of these fundamental areas. Um, but I do think it's important that like the, the, the essential definition of value, even though value isn't mentioned in here, uh, but this concept of benefit is actually included in all of these points. So, so thinking about value and benefit to, to patients and to communities is, is really important when designing a well-functioning health system. So can our current systems help achieve value? And can what we do help achieve value and help achieve a well-functioning health system? And I borrowed this slide from Eric Schneider from um, Commonwealth um, because I think it shows that a lot of, oops, I keep on doing that, I'm sorry. A, lo a lot of what we've been doing is in this space. We're optimizing current approaches. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of taking what we have now and adding something here. Maybe we're starting to do some innovation for existing delivery and payment systems. You know, I've heard about health systems actually um, taking their homeless patients and, and, and renting them, you know, apartments because, and that reduces inappropriate ED visits. That, that might be kind of in this adjacent, adjacent space. But to really kind of move us forward, I think it's going to take transformational approaches, uh, new delivery systems, and probably disruptive approaches. Um, and what do I mean by disruptive? Um, this, I, I turn to Clayton Christensen, um, who wrote The Innovator's Prescription, as well as other books. And he said there's three kind of components or elements needed for disruptive innovation. The first is a technological enabler. Um, we've talked about precision medicine here. That might be an example of a technological uh, enabler, mobile health, different way of delivering care, thinking about that care delivery. We need innovative business models, probably more than one. Um, so value-based payment or value-based insurance design may be one of those. Um, but so might be the minute clinics, right, that now we're delivering care in a completely different way. But to put it all together, you need an economically coherent value network. 
Um, these things can't exist in silos. Um, so an economically coherent value network somehow has to knit together providers, employers, consumers, and the community uh, to make this all work. So I think it was about that kind of disruption, I'm gonna go back to Bob, uh, that Bob was thinking about in this article about big ideas and big interventions. And you know, he was really lamenting that a lot of the interventions that have been tried have been incremental. Even when they were big ideas, we didn't do big interventions. And they really didn't work. So for those of you who know Bob, he likes what ifs, right? He likes to get you thinking. And he said, what if a community and its health professionals formed an organization whose purpose was to maintain health and prevent premature death at an affordable cost? Would the community demand, he asked, that inappropriate care be eliminated? Would health professionals agree to involve the community as an equal partner in improving quality and eliminating waste? And I added this question. Would an academic medical center, or maybe several, join the partnership to help test and evaluate innovative approaches to achieving these goals? Would the University of Michigan? Would UCLA and the UC system? Because if not, what are we waiting for? Because physicians today face mounting pressure to use procedures only when clinically valid criteria indicate they are appropriate, the government's limits on healthcare financing, businesses' efforts to curb health insurance costs, increasing concern over large regional variations in procedure use, all add to these pressures. Bob said this in 1986. So left unchanged, healthcare will continue to underperform, cause unnecessary harm, and strain national, state, and family budgets. The actions required to reverse this trend will be notable, substantial, sometimes disruptive, and absolutely necessary, the IOM in 2012. And this um, was from a National Academy of Medicine um, um, publication that Eugene Washington, your former Dean, executive dean was um, a member of. And they said a health system grappling with increasing pressures to improve quality while reducing costs depends on the tools of innovation and workforce effectiveness and efficiency to achieve the triple aim of better care, lower costs, and improve health outcomes. Stewarding these capacities is critical to the future of American health, and the function depends on the success and adaptability of academic health systems. So I'm proud that both my alma mater, UCLA, and my current institution, the University of Michigan, have been not only the leaders in developing the foundations for understanding and measuring quality and value, but are also now the leaders in promoting transformational change. Because I feel the time is right for academic health systems to promote such change that drives high value <laughs> patient-centered care. Thank you. I know these questions stand between us and lunch, so yeah. Yeah. Um, if no one wants to ask any, all right. <laughs> Thanks for a wonderful talk. So, um, Eve, you're such a great model talking about this important topic and putting it together in a very uh, nicely integrated way. Can you say something about um, your training or your history or something that got you to put together these values and this science to come up with these recommendations. And I'm asking because after all, we're in ac an academic setting, so maybe there's something we can learn about this. Um, sure, uh, you know, as I said, I, I, started, um, I started thinking about this um, w really at UCLA, um, and actually it was, um, and Catherine may remember, because um, Catherine was my attending when I was an intern, um, <laughs> that, um, when I was a second year resident, um, UCLA made a uh, dramatic shift in uh, being able to see patients who had Medi-Cal uh, Medi insurance. And they said, we can't see them in our clinics anymore. Neil may remember this too, where's Neil? Um, and um, 
that, that really infuriated me. I, I was on the wards and I had these really sick patients and I had nowhere to send them. I mean, literally we were sending them to the Harbor ER for follow up, right? Um, and, and I got really angry. I complained about it every single day on the wards <laughs> until my attending, Al Sue, who is a former clinical scholar and geriatrician, the head of geriatrics at Mount Sinai, uh, pinned up an article in our rounding room by yet another former UCLA clinical scholar, Nikki Lurie, um, where she studied what happened to Medicaid patients, uh, Medi-Cal patients who lost their Medi-Cal um, some years before that. Um, and he, she said to me, you know what? Don't just complain about it, study it, and then change it. And that was really kind of my motivating factor. That's what got me to be a clinical scholar. I wasn't really, I, you know, my, I might have been like a specialist doing lab research, but that changed like my approach. So all of us as clinicians, as uh, mentors can make a difference. Um, I, I did, I, I did a study that uh, completely shepherded me, shepherded me through as a resident. I became um, a RWJ clinical scholar. I started working with Bob who said, you know, there's just so much we don't know. And that's, you know, his theme, like how, how, do, we, how do we fix these things? Um, so really then learning at UCLA about um, appropriateness, I, I studied actually capitation and, and health systems, really became interested in health systems at that time and quality. And then started working with Beth um, and learned a lot about quality measurement, how we measure quality. And then I moved to the VA. So when I moved to Michigan, I moved to the VA. And that was really, a, has been to this day, a really unique experience because um, I get to work in a healthcare system. It really is a system. It's an integrated system. Yes, it has problems, okay? <laughs> but it has actually far more benefits than problems. What you hear about are the problems. Um, and so I've been able to work very closely with partners, um, both in measurement and in improvement spaces, and that's been a very meaningful experience to me. Um, so all these, um, I think, experiences have um, led me now to start doing more applied work, and that's how we uh, started the Improve program, because I think being able to draw on, you know, both kind of what, what I know and what other health services researchers know um, and can contribute and actually try to change um, our, the, the way our own system works has been really important to me. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I could talk longer, but I guess that. I can hear. Okay. <laughs> so a couple slides back, you talked about healthcare organizations, communities coming together to solve this larger problem. And um, I've been witnessing this going on in a handful of communities here in the United States. So if you look at what's going on in San Diego, um, through I think it's called their uh, Live Well San Diego, this is this 10-year plan where they're really trying to transform what all these different uh, systems, whether somebody uh, ends up in jail and then back out into the community. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, that happened to me several years ago is uh, that community approached me uh, because I think what they wanted to do was to conduct some very sound research uh, to demonstrate that there's been some benefit from this work that they've been doing. Um, and uh, I think they were struck by sort of the challenge of, um, you know, so many different interventions coming together at the same time to try to affect change um, and how to think about doing this kind of evaluation work. Um, and I guess what I'm sort of interested in, you know, talking to people about, because if we think this is what's needed to move the dial, A, how do we, you know, start working with community partners to make that happen, and can you do it in a place as complex as Los Angeles? Um, maybe this would work in Ann Arbor a bit better, I don't know. Um, and then secondly, how do we work to measure what's going on in those experiments to make sure that we understand if they're working? Um, and yielding the benefits we want. Yeah. Um, 
So that's kind of um, a multi-part question. Um, I think it takes, the first part is it takes commitment from the communities like San Diego, but I mean, the other, the other place, and you guys may have other examples, but where I, I'm seeing this done is Washington State. Like, so the whole, you know, the whole state of, of Washington has formed a choosing wisely I know, collaborative, or, and so there are uh, many, many health systems have joined that and are measuring the quality of care within their health systems and then testing different intervention approaches. Um, so, um, so that's one thing, they're doing that for um, cancer care as well, high value cancer care, again, across the whole state, which is pretty impressive. Um, so it takes commitment, it takes investment, um, and so it, it's naive to think that there's gonna be some organization, you know, that NIH is gonna pay for, for that kind of thing, you know. So each of the systems that are involved are actually gonna have to make some kind of investment in order to do that. And some of that, what works and what doesn't work is gonna have to be done on the ground um, by people who are working in those communities. I, I don't, I think it's, it's gonna, like as researchers, we're used to controlling, and I think we're gonna have to get comfortable with not controlling as much and with collaborating um, and and kind of allowing others to, um, you know, we guide, but others um, actually kind of do the work. Um, so it, it may be a little bit messy. Um, what was the third point that you asked? I don't remember now. <laughs> no, just how we think about evaluating. Yeah. Very complex, um, yeah. And then, so then the other thing, a lot of it is what you said already, which is it's going to take mixed methods um, approaches. So we, um, you know, most of us trained in quantitative methods, and we use a lot of quantitative um, measures, which is fine. Uh, but to really get to that understanding, we're going to have to use a, a lot of qualitative, more qualitative interviewing um, approaches and trying to understand what works and what doesn't work. Um, but there are large undertakings for sure. Um, my name is Carl Bertel. I'm at uh, UCLA and Cedar sinai and I'm an emergency physician. And um, my question for you is, how do we change, um, how do we educate patients about the risks of obtaining healthcare services? You know, you mentioned your snowbird example. And I think the reason I bring this question up now is that I've, ex I've experienced a dramatic shift in demand for opioids over the last several months from my patients. I have patients saying, I don't want opioids because I understand the risks. And I would love that if they could understand the risks of um, seeking any type of care, particularly in the emergency department, before they even walk through the door. <laughs> um, so how, how do they understand that, you know, even if I order a CT scan, it's not necessarily just playing it safe, that there are, you know, risks involved with radiation and incidental findings. Are there ways that we can educate patients before they even show up about these things? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, I've, I've noted that also with opioids, that a lot of patients, you know, either come in saying, I want get off these things or, or, or they don't want to initiate, which is, which is great, and that public information has been helpful. It, it's probably also been harmful in some cases, right, because there are some patients who really should get opioids and, um, and, and now they don't want them, even when it's, you know, kind of end of life um, palliative treatment. Um, so we have to be careful with how we do our education um, or campaigns. Um, so I, I think that I, I'm not going to be able to answer your question about like how to do that. I, I think that that is um, trying to understand the motivation of patients. Are they scared? Um, you know, low back pain is a great example. Like, you know, I would never go to the ED with my low back pain unless I really couldn't walk or something, you know, because I know it's just going to go away, but we haven't um, kind of gotten that word out. And so patients are scared and they want to know what's wrong with me. Um, how can we um, address that without actually doing a full workup. Um, and maybe there are approaches, depending on what's driving the patient to go there, that will be different. And they'll probably be different for different communities and different populations. Um, and so, like I said, there's been so little research in this area asking patients anything. Um, so I think that's where we start. We, we start by trying to understand what patients' motivations are, what patients' fears are, um, and what they would accept as potential substitutes. So in some of our early work um, on focus groups in this, a lot of our patients are saying, okay, well, yeah, you can take away my benzodiazepines, but what are you gonna give me instead? How am I gonna get to sleep at night? What, you know? And when you tell them, well, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, they go, oh, okay, well, if I could do that and it works, that'd be okay. You know, so really trying to get at that. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Phyllis Willis, and I'm really excited to be here. I loved your talk and all the points um, that are very relevant to the work that we do at Watts Labor Community Action Committee. I'm their senior uh, aging program director, and we serve about 22 zip codes in South Los Angeles, Compton, Watts. Uh, we have about 180 properties, and uh, many of those are in South Central, uh, Compton, and Watts as well. So as you can imagine, we have a high rate of chronic conditions. Uh, one of the, uh, you spoke earlier about how do we get the community involved, and I want to say that Los Angeles is one of the greatest places to involve the community. I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Dr. Sarkeesian, to Catherine, for coming to uh, South LA, right across the street from Watts, about 12 years ago. And one of the difference in her research was that she asked the question, what do you need, mm -hmm. versus everybody tells you what you have to have or this is what my research project is about, or this is what I'm gonna get published. So I kind of was stopping people, <laughs> sorry and no offense, um, <laughs> kind of started stopping folks at the door. And when she sat down um, and talked to me, I, I gave her a list of things. You know, we, we deal with folks coming in the door that are passing out because their blood sugar is 500. So they went into a stroke over minor things of not knowing portion size and what to eat, controlling their blood pressure. I mean, this is common every single day. So we live, deal with isolation. They have three or more chronic conditions. So one of the thoughts that we had was the Stanford University Chronic Disease Self-Management. So flew there, became a master trainer. The idea is to train the community because all the questions that were being asked about what is, the, that's where you show the lack of information and data on what does a patient think. You know, you only had two areas. But in that particular um, curriculum, many of the questions, it's a se session where they, all they ask are questions. What does your provider do? How, what's the issues you see? So, you know, it's a long brainstorming, but the, that particular data could really be useful to the studies in the future. So what I would like to say is that you have to continue to partner with the community. Sometimes it's a difficult marriage between academics and the community, and sometimes it's a little fear. You know, you mentioned the word Compton or Watts. Oh, my God, you know, folks feel that uh, it's uncomfortable. So we decided we're in the community. We, we've, we've now gone into 12 senior housings besides our own because there's a problem with access, which is transportation. Uh, one of the things I heard mentioned was social, but there's a big economic difference among African Americans and Latinos. And I, I did a talk up, up north, and uh, it's not one size fits all. You know, African Americans spiritually, there's a lot of things that connect us, but when you look at Ladera Heights, which is predominantly African American, the income is $8,000 a month. You look at Watts, the income is probably about $1,000 a month, you know, for the family. And they have 2.12 miles, square miles, and 17,000 people are squeezed into that small amount. So you can understand it's a lot of chronic conditions. So getting to the streets is using programs such as a chronic disease self-management that covers a lot of what you, you went over, but how do you capture that data? Kate Lorick, um, I don't know if you know who she is, she did a great job on capturing and researching this with Kaiser in the early days, but how do we continue to build on that and make it relevant today? It's Catherine did a great job of a stroke program we did for five years, coming into the community, bringing her research assistants in. It was education for them. And many left there saying, wow, I would love to work in this community and be a doctor in this community. And then it was educational for staff. It's not just they were able to go to UCLA, be trained as case managers, come back, and they thought they were doctors mentioning biomarkers, and they were just very <laughs> excited. But it, it actually does a lot to increase their resume. or it, So it's, it's so much more being done uh, with this type of information and this choosing wisely. Uh, I'm working on a proposal right now, so I was taking those feverishly because <laughs> it's due in about 10 days. But a lot of what you actually have uh, listed is very relevant to any kind of, and it's a, the proposals regarding uh, chronic conditions, diabetes. You know, how do we take this information and the goals that were listed there and incorporate that, as you said, leaders, community leaders, healthcare providers, clinicians, how do we make that all work? And I think Catherine is one of the folks that I know has done a really good job in that area. So how do we duplicate that yeah. on a broader level? All right. Well, uh, first of all, what you're doing is so incredibly important. And um, I think that um, 
the, the questions about um, how, how do we work together um, to make uh, care better in these communities is, um, I think, the fun, really the fundamental one. And um, understanding what the needs of the community are and starting from there instead of um, us researchers coming in saying, oh, yeah, I want to know how to, you know, reduce something or improve something. Um, it works much better. So congratulations to, to you and Catherine and the partnerships you've had with other researchers. Um, the, um, I think that this is actually an example and a potential for transformational change um, because you understand the problems in your community. And the fixes are probably not... Um, you know, oh, well, we just need to do less, of, you know, less of something. The fixes are much more fundamental. Like, well, you know, you asked about the emergency department. Why are people coming into the emergency we department? Well, that. like, a lot of times in the VA, it's because they're homeless, and when they come into the emergency department, they're actually going to get a meal, and they might sit there for right. six hours, right? right? That's a very different issue than I'm, I'm just worried about my low back pain, right. you know? And so really understanding those fundamental drivers, again, you know, some of the same um, question, and having co maybe completely different approaches to it, because it may not really even be a healthcare solution. Right. Right. It may be a food delivery solution. It may right. be making sure people have housing. Um, you know, it may be helping with after school care or whatever it is. Those are very different solutions right. if you understand what the problems are. Um, and then, of course, you can get to the, you know, for the p population for whom it's relevant, the kind of the relevant healthcare solutions. Right. Right. So taking this broader global, and I think that the, the researchers here and at USC and at UCLA and RAND, um, I think they're ready to kind of take on those approaches. And I, I'm sure that Catherine's group um, is still continuing to work with you, but we'll probably will want to even expand, expand those collaborations because the, the questions are, are so different um, depending on the context and that and that's you know one of the things that we really have to be aware of so you know congratulations on the work that you're Thank doing you. and I'm supposed to stop that's what Natalie said so, <laughs> Thank you. so it's lunchtime yeah? <laughs>